I am, I have been a member of the New Jersey Historic Trust Board since 2011. I'm the immediate past chair. And for my uh, retirement as chair, I got to, I am now uh, head of the Grants and Loans Committee. And as you know, Grants and Loans is, is one of the important things that the New Jersey Historic Trust does. Um, in that position, and also as a member of the New Jersey State Review Board, which assesses nominations to the National Register, I have really deepened my love for New Jersey historic buildings, and I have incredible respect for everyone who works to restore, maintain, promote, and interpret the many resources we share across the state. I know it takes perseverance, and it takes money to do it. So I am honored to be representing the New Jersey Historic Trust today, uh, which I will refer to as the trust throughout this program. You can certainly read what our mission is and you can find New Jersey Historic Trust on the web, um, but we are an organization established to provide education, stewardship and financial investment for historic sites around the state. We consider ourselves uh, a partner in state policy development and a resource. The staff is an incredible resource for technical issues about preserving buildings. The trust was created by law in 1967 to preserve New Jersey's historic resources. Um, it, it currently provides an annual source of matching funds from the state corporate business tax for historic preservation projects. The trust was established by the state legislature in 1967, but it role, the role really expanded in 1987 when New Jersey voters passed a ballot referendum establishing a funding source for capital preservation projects throughout with the sale of state bonds, similar to our established Green Acres program. We were the first state to establish a capital preservation program. Even today, only a few other states have this kind of preservation funding. In 2014, another voter approved render and referendum shifted the funding from bond sales that took place every couple of years to an annual appropriation from the corporate business tax to support open space acquisition, farmland preservation, and historic preservation activities. Open space referenda are extremely popular in the country's most densely populated state. Open space has a far larger constituency than New Jersey, in New Jersey than historic preservation, but the Barnegat Light reminds us that there is no open space in New Jersey that has not been shaped in some way by humans. And we often identify the open spaces with the tangible landmarks that stand on them. The lighthouse, operational from 1834 to 1933, is owned by the state of New Jersey, but a friends group is active in monitoring and maintaining the site. It is enjoyed by thousands in the summer months, as much for its history and exhibits as for the long climb to the top to get that view of the Atlantic coast. It is such an iconic image of the Jersey Shore that it is used on the vanity plates that help support open space organizations but it is the New Jersey Historic Trust that periodically funds the repainting and restoration of the building. You can help support the trust with purchase of a history license plate. Look for it next time you renew your registration and know that your fee supports small group grants for innovative efforts at heritage tourism around the state. The trust currently administers three main types of grant awards for historic sites around the state. The historic site management and heritage tourism, which are generally what we might call planning grants. Um, capital level one and two, one and two is just the, the price range. One meaning grant requests from 5,000 to $150,000. Level two are the largest grants 150 to $750,000. And new last year, a multi-phase grant program. Um, if you have a very large project that you know is going to be taking several years and you have the plan to carry that out, 
Um, you can apply for a multi-phase grant and secure it in successive years without having to reapply each year. Every grant program has a match, which is money that has come up with from the sponsoring organization, um, might include donations from private citizens, from other public sources, um, but it does require a match depending on the amount. And generally, this is an order. You have to do a plan first. You cannot scoop in here and say, yeah, I have a multi-phase project that's gonna take me four years. Um, the trust will want to see the plan first and we'll help you pay for that um, back in the historic site management grants first. And then your next outing might be a capital level one to build capacity for doing this grant. And then you get to level two and perhaps you would move to a multi-phase as well, depending on the project. Eligibility includes wooden elephants like Lucy the Margate elephant, our 1881 seaside attraction, um, still an attraction at the shore of Atlantic City, um, but also agencies of the state, agencies of the county, um, nonprofits that are compliant with 501c regulations and properties must be listed on the state and national register of historic places. By the way, Lucy um, has long been supported by the trust. I'm sorry. Um, again, a landmark of the shore, but that wooden and metal body needs constant maintenance because she's very close to the shore. She gets a lot of sun, she gets storms, and she gets seagulls. Um, so we have been uh, a sponsor of Lucy for just about the entire time that the trust has been in existence. If you need to hop off this call and you're short of time today, you must write down what is on this, this slide. And after this, I will show lots of pretty pictures and show lots of examples of work the trust has done, but if you are even dreaming, thinking about going to the New Jersey Historic Trust for a grant, the most important thing is to visit their website and contact a staff member. Um, this, is, this is key. I will show this slide again at the end, but I'm just saying, I know everybody's busy. If you're too busy to do anything else, write down a number or two and I will wait 20 seconds for you to do that. Um, because this is this is the key to to you, you, the beginning of your journey there. The U.S. Life Saving Station in Ocean City is an example of a significant type of life saving station associated with the activities of the life saving service that eventually became the Coast Guard. This building was constructed in 1885. Um, when it was one of 25 life-saving saving stations um, dotted along the Jersey Shore. The building was expanded in about 1905 to nearly double its original size. And it was finally decommissioned by, this, by the Coast Guard in the 1940s and sold. After a somewhat tumultuous period in private property, the city of Ocean City acquired the property in 2010 and began a restoration plan only to see it significantly damaged in Hurricane Sandy in 2012. Um, as you know, the Hurricane Sandy brought some federal relief funding and some of it was targeted specifically for the preservation of historic sites. Um, the New Jersey Historic Trust was granted or given the opportunity to be the administrator for those grant funds, overseeing how they were spent, making sure that projects met the Secretary of Interior's standards. So after a very long time, um, the Life Saving Station was finally restored fully in 2017. One of the issues is that when, when the project started, um, there was every intention of restoring the building as it had been after the 1905 edition, and that is a very sound preservation principle. 
But if you can see to the right, and I don't know where your, um, if, if you have your gallery in, in place or not, but if you make that go away to the very far right of the right-hand picture, you'll see the buildings in the, the residences in the block behind the life-saving station, and that they have all been elevated because of the threat of flooding. It's, that is a whole nother preservation question about elevating historic buildings, but it's certainly not something that could be done with a building that's intended to be sitting on the ground so you can drag your boat out and go rescue people at sea. So there are beginning to be some conflicts between preservation practice as we used to know it and preservation practice, preserving a building into the future when we are likely to have more storms and more rising water that could seriously threaten this building. The East Point Lighthouse is on the Delaware Bay. New Jersey has coastal resources stretching south from New York Harbor along 127 miles of Atlantic shore and up into the Delaware Bay and eventually up the Delaware River to form the entire western boundary of the state. To aid navigation along the shallow edges of the Delaware Bay, the East Point Lighthouse was established by 1850. Rising water threatens the site now. East Point underwent a complete restoration completed in 2019 that involved the Trust, the Army Corps of Engineers, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, and the local historical society who operate the lighthouse as a museum and a destination point in a complex of bayside marshes popular with bird watchers. Planning and engineering documents were a critical part of the restoration of this building. Further expanding the meaning of historic preservation is the requirement to relocate utilities from the lower level of this building because of frequent flooding. So far, the first floor has not flooded, but it could. Should the building be raised to preserve it? Should further barriers be erected around the site? When flooding breaches the existing barrier, as it does about once a month, the water has nowhere to go because the building originally was built right on the edge of the water. Um, the preservation questions tackled by the trust and its grant applicants are often on the cutting edge of current issues. And all of these we will have expanded as eligible activities if it is decided in a plan that these are appropriate maneuvers for the building. Yes, there is a village in New Jersey known as Bivalve and no surprise, it was the center of the oyster industry from the late 19th century to the mid 20th century. Focusing on heritage tourism at Bivalve has helped keep buildings extant and a rich knowledge of the ecosystems of the Bay alive. But flooding at this waterside site has led to the preservation studies, considering the possibility of adding platforms over the existing walkways so people can access them without actually getting wet. Presently, these docks flood multiple times a month, depending on precipitation and tides. The trust supports preservation efforts across a wide spectrum of activities, and the preservation plans to address current and future responses to water incursion, incursion due to climate change are among them. Bivalve only exists today as a heritage tourism site. Part of the Trust's initiatives are to encourage heritage tourism. At Bivalve, the Trust expanded, helped to expand the creation of interpretive panels, a short film explaining the planting and harvesting of oysters, and research and design of the interpretive exhibit on the cashier, a National Register listed oyster schooner. Bivalve is part of the Trust's online Journey Through Jersey webpage that directs people to sites around the state, searchable by location, historical period, and interest areas. Capital investments in buildings are only as good as the use a site can get, and so the Trust does want to encourage visitors to the sites that are specifically touristic in their nature. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Great Falls of the Passaic, a natural wonder which has drawn tourists for a very long time, <coughs> is now part of a very urbanized complex of buildings in Patterson. Water is the enemy of buildings, 
but also the foundation of the industrial economy of New Jersey. Alexander Hamilton proposed a manufacturing center in a new city to be called Patterson in 1792. Its industrial processes would be powered by the Great Falls of the Passaic. The city of Patterson's industrial might extended into the 20th century with the rise of electrical production created at this 1914 power station. The generating station building is still in use, but decades of exposure to mist generated by the falls deteriorated the masonry. The trust supported grants for masonry repair and repointing and terracotta repair and replacement, allowing this historic building to continue to generate renewable energy and carry on the tradition of harnessing the Great Falls. This 19th century mill speaks of earlier and simpler industrial technology in New Jersey. Part of the reason for the mill's longevity was its conversion from grinding grain to grinding graphite in the 20th century, and it only ceased industrial use in 1970. It is now owned by the Muskanetcong Watershed Association, an environmental group, but one that is keenly aware of the links between the river and human occupation over the centuries. One of the goals for the mill is to achieve LEAD, leadership in energy and environmental design status as part of an overall restoration. Plans have included green measures throughout the property. When fully restored with funds that include those from the New Jersey Historic Trust, the mill will become a community center and environmental learning center. Acorn Hall in Morristown is a mid 19th century mansion that's been the headquarters of the Morris County Historical Society for almost 70 years. It has evolved from house museum to historic site, showcasing its interior, its gardening and programming. The trust has supported traditional activities like roof repairs, but also accessibility studies to make the building more welcoming to people of all ages and abilities and also a research study on paint analysis and performance to identify the best way to get a long lasting exterior paint job using today's materials. Modern materials are wonderful. Modern materials are terrible. Choosing widely and using wisely is pushing the Secretary of Interior's standards which guide all publicly funded preservation work in the United States to accept that exact replacement in kind may no longer always be an appropriate option. The dedicated staff at New Jersey Historic Trust can help sites and their professionals explore the best way to do this while still maintaining historic integrity. Along the Delaware River, not far north of Philadelphia, stands the Shippen Mansion, built about 1869 and a wonderful example of the Second Empire style that was so popular at that time. After the Shippen family passed away in 1917, the property became home to the Red Dragon Canoe Club, popular with sailing and canoeing enthusiasts. Damage from Hurricane Sandy in 2012 focused the club on the condition of their headquarters. Federal Sandy relief funds were coupled with a grant from the trust for a phased restoration of the building. All trust grants require easements placed on buildings that receive them to ensure public access and protect the building from inappropriate changes to the historic appearance and materials. Buildings that have always been in public use are often the recipients of trust grants, but perhaps none more innovative than for a response to flooding and anticipated water rise over the next century than the flood proofing work done at the Hoboken Public Library. A restoration was interrupted by Hurricane Sandy in 2012 causing a rethinking of the use of this tall multi-floored building. Basement spaces were emptied of books and utilities, a complex but completely hidden dry flood proofing system of dams and gates was installed around the building to hold back water, sort of a reverse moat in the event of flooding. The Hoboken Public Library is recognized in new guidelines being issued by the National Park Service for climate mitigation. This new preservation brief is due out in February, next week. Look for it and think about incorporating its principles in your building. I've talked a lot directly and indirectly about New Jersey Historic Trust's willingness and response to consider the effects of climate change on historic buildings and supporting innovative ways to deal with that as much as possible. 
This will remain a critical focus of the trust's evaluation of future grant rounds. But in light of new awareness of the need to enlarge the stories of America, this year the trust is announcing a new initiative supporting underrepresented histories. In some cases, like in the Trent House, a building is already recognized for its architecture, for its ownership by an early settler, William Trent. And many visitors come to learn the story of the settlement of West Jersey through this house. But recent archeological digs to find the dependencies that are shown in historic photographs and further archival research has revealed that the story of the Trent House is not just about the upper class Trent family, but about their slaves. Reassessing existing sites to include black history and other long marginalized American histories allows a richer story of America to emerge. The New Jersey Historic Trust is committed to helping sites explore their underrepresented histories, as well as discover new sites um, that relate to those histories in order to make a more compelling case for the state's overall preservation investment. This 19th century Quaker family's home is lovely, but not unique in Burlington County. However, Alice Paul, who grew up there, became one of America's leading suffragettes in the fight for women's right to vote. And she remained true to the cause of equal rights for all of her life. The Alice Paul Institute showcases the house as a museum, but it is active more in programming around the issues of women's rights, leadership development, and other women's issues. Promoting Alice Paul and the idea of equality among people is another example of civil rights that can be promoted through New Jersey Historic Trust's Underrepresented Histories Initiative. The DeVore Farm was originally part of a huge tract owned by William Penn, who in addition to being the founder of Pennsylvania had extensive holdings in New Jersey. Penn passed the land to his sons, who in the age old tradition of real estate development promptly divided it into parcels and sold it off. One such parcel was sold to a German immigrant named Johann Philipp Case, later ang anglicized to John Case in 1738. The property stayed in the Case family for more than a century and then went into the ownership of the DeVore family. Finally, the DeVores sold it as a dairy farm in the 1990s. For many years, the citizens for Parkland had spearheaded efforts to preserve the farm. In 1999, the farm was sold to the South Branch Watershed Association, which in turn conveyed it to the Hunterdon Land Trust. The 18th century DeVore House has become the headquarters of the Hunterdon Land Trust. They sought assistance from the New Jersey Historic Trust, first for the headquarters house and traditional preservation activities like foundation and roof repairs. But over the years, they realized that the 40 acre farm had multiple outbuildings that were of interest in the story of New Jersey's agricultural development and provided opportunities for the Hundred and Land Trust to use space as community meeting centers and educational programming spaces. Recent archeology span work on the farmstead site has revealed Lenny Lenape's settlement on their land. Over the past two decades, the Hundred and Land Trust has moved from a strict strict preserve the land and let it return to nature philosophy to one that acknowledges that they are only momentary stewards of land and buildings that reflect a complex story of history and people and place. They are a strong partner for New Jersey Historic Trust in advocating preservation of land in the conservation community and their care for their very visible building has brought them much more support from the community. Another successful partnership between New Jersey Historic Trust and an open space advocacy group, the New York New Jersey Trails Association, led to the restoration of the Darlington Schoolhouse, designed and built by a prominent Newport, Rhode Island architect, Dudley Newton in 1891. It was a gift to the Mawa community by Alfred B. Darling and Theodore Havemeyer, who owned farm estates in the Ramapo Valley. Local children attended classes in this building until the 1940s, and it later housed a dance school and a carpentry shop. The schoolhouse sat empty for nearly 40 years 
before the Trail Conference and the Township of Mawa jointly purchased the building in 2007. With meticulous attention to detail, the Darlington Schoolhouse was restored in two phases, finally completed in 2015. The New York-New Jersey Trail Conference is a volunteer-powered organization that builds, maintains, and protects public trails. They strive to ensure that the trails and the natural areas we share are sustainable and accessible to all. There could hardly be a greater contrast with the woodsy out of doors that the Trail Association oversees and Greenwood Gardens, the highly manicured landscape on a former estate in Milburn, New Jersey. It is considered one of the outstanding examples of early 20th century arts and crafts garden design. The garden, once part of a private estate, is now open to the public, providing much, much needed open space in highly developed Essex County. The trust has supported restoration of the gardens and has always been interested in supporting landscape architecture as well as building architecture. Those elaborate gardens on estates were only one expression of the increasing wealth and power of elite Americans in the 19th and 20th centuries. Cultural institutions founded in our major cities continue as vibrant parts of the modern world and need financial support for aging buildings. The trust has supported literal museum quality restoration at the Newark Museum and in other museums around the state housed in historic buildings. Of course, the wealth of New Jersey's cities and gardens and estates came from factories. In its prime years, Trenton's Roebling Company was known for the production of steel wire rope for some of the nation's most famous suspension bridges, including the Brooklyn Bridge and the George Washington Bridges in New York and the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. The sprawling red brick compound founded by John Roebling in 1848 also produced telephone and telegraph wire elevator wire, lightning rods, and railway cables. The machine shop is the oldest and most intact structure in the 45-acre complex. It was built in 1890 and modified several times in the early 1900s. Two trust grants helped fund exterior restoration and site improvements. A third grant a few years later helped fund the rehabilitation of the building as the Museum of Contemporary Science. Like all trust grant recipients, the Roebling Museum and Science Museum uh, is covered by an easement held by the New Jersey Historic Trust to ensure that future changes to the building are reviewed for compatibility with the restoration work that we have paid for. The Cedar Bridge Tavern is a classic 18th century vernacular building. It claims to be home to the oldest extant bar in America um, and deep in the Pine Barrens, it is an example of a building that didn't so much need restoration as deep cleaning and continued preservation of its 18th century fabric. This is perhaps the most traditional of the many types of preservation projects that the trust funds. And while I've talked about many innovative ideas for preservation work around climate change, new site interpretations, and new understanding of building types, they are all part of a continuum that still contains traditional capital investment preservation projects for 18th century wooden buildings. The trust welcomes all applications from all sites all over New Jersey that tell the story of New Jersey. The Abel and Mary Nicholson house it is, is an astonishingly well-preserved pattern and brick house, a type of vernacular building associated with the 18th century Quaker communities of Southwest New Jersey. Built in 1722, this house has never had plumbing or electricity, but it is now located on an island in the marshy lowlands by the Delaware Bay, certainly not the situation when it was built. It is not able to be open to the public except by special appointment, and then access must be timed to low tide. A trust grant helped fund the installation of non-invasive fire detection and suppression equipment at this isolated site. We have not given up on it yet, despite the rising waters. So from fire suppression systems to repointing, from partnering with traditional historical organizations to open space conservancies, the New Jersey Historic Trust has developed a series of innovative grant programs to help support capital improvement in our state's diverse historic resources. 
We have just opened a new grant round for 2021, and we invite inquiries if you are within the state of New Jersey. You're not too late. Tomorrow is a Zoom meeting for the trust with members of the staff to explain the grant process itself in more detail. Please contact the trust and register ahead of time and think about attending, even if you don't think you're ready to apply this year, being prepared is the first step. Thank you very much for listening. And Mark, why don't you take it from here? Thank you very much, uh, Janet. Um, and for more information about the trust programs and actually other resources for the trust, can, can you mention a bit about uh, uh, where folks can get additional information? njht.org, New Jersey Historic Trust.org. Um, right, yeah, and there's wonderful resources that are posted there. Um, also information on the building a place for history, uh, the 2021 New Jersey History and Historic Preservation Conference. Right. Uh, which uh, looks like maybe uh, at some point in June uh, in a virtual sense. Watch that, watch that space. We should have firm dates in another week and a half and it will be virtual. And we look forward to everyone on this call and many, many, many more attending. Great. Again, uh, thank you, Janet. And Emily, I'll, I'll turn it back over uh, to you for the uh, questions. Great, thank you. Thank you, Janet, and, and thank you, Mark. Um, so I, a couple of folks put questions in the chat box um, during the, uh, session for uh, for Janet. So I'll just read uh, read those here. And, and if other folks have questions, I think maybe the chat box is probably the best way just of the size of this group. So the first question was from um, Susanna uh, to Janet, would you be able to share the reasons why these kinds of grants are only available to business entities and charitable organizations and not to homeowners? Um, I think I think I'm not muted. There we, there we go. No, I'm not. Thank you. Um, it's not even business organizations. It's, it's public entities and nonprofit groups. Um, funding of private property, of, of homeowner property, is, is not a traditional grant activity for public funding. This is state money. Um, it goes to national register sites that have a state presence. Your house may even be on the register, um, but as the rules have developed and, and law on this has developed, it is not available to private property owners. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Another question that was placed in the chat is from Dennis. Dennis says, what are the requirements for public access to buildings that have been given grants? That's a very good question, Dennis. It does not mean 24 seven, anybody can walk in. And I think depending on the site and what, they're, um, what they do, how they're staffed, what their accessibility is, they work out an accessibility plan with the trust as part of the grant agreement and the ongoing easement. And it may be, it could be a variety of things. It could be free public access to the grounds, but more limited access to a building if that's your situation. It could be one day a month, there will be, it will be open and the rest of the time it will not. It could be um, that the property has maybe open as a paid, you know, admission sometimes, but has free admission on special on other times that is truly public access. That is individually worked out, but I guarantee you it is not seven days a week or even five days a week that's a requirement. Um, it depends what the building does and what else is going on in there. But it's a good question and it's something to think about. You do need some level of public access. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like uh, Dennis just kind of added on. Let's see. Um, okay, great. Uh, now, we have another question from Richard in the chat. Um, can you expand on the, um, the trust preservation of the history of enslaved people and perhaps that new initiative uh, that you mentioned that the trust is engaging in? 
knowing that we are just starting this, knowing that there are um, lots of sites that have not yet been identified because, because those histories are not well known, um, the trust grants might go for a National Register nomination, which is really the first step to, to promoting a historic site and perhaps eventually getting grant to recognize a site in that way. It, if there is a site that is recognized, um, that has connections with, with slave history, and many, many, many do in New Jersey, it's just they are not brought forward in their interpretation or in their National Register nomination. Um, so a way of bringing, bringing that forward could make the site look more attractive in a grant round. We are aware that it's January and the grants are due in April and this is a tremendous amount of research and we are not expecting every site in New Jersey to come up with their relationship to slaveholding or emancipation or civil rights efforts in the next four months. It is intended to get particularly the owners of existing historic sites like the Trent House, to think about this and expanding their um, interpretation and their outreach by including broader stories of slaves, of women, of LGBTQ people, of, of lots of underrepresented histories in our sites around the state. Great, thank you. And thanks for that question, Richard. And can I say this will, this is the start of a multi-year initiative. Last year, we kind of concluded the women's initiative, which we had in place for like six years because the anniversary, not that it doesn't count, but we had the anniversary of, of the enactment of the 21st Amendment. So we have a new, um, a new initiative. So it will be, it will be around for several years. Thank you. Uh, Dorothy has a question. Does historic preservation apply to furniture and such that may have been inside um, the bleedings or the- The buildings. The buildings, sure okay. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> reading off there. Typically, no, but if it's a built-in, like a craftsman style, settle hearth arrangement where it's all integral to the actual architecture, I suppose an argument could be made. Um, this is why it all goes back to a plan, a real solid preservation plan. But the trust focus is a building, a landscape, a setting, um, and not movables. Although we have funded boats, they are movable. You know, the cashier and some, some of the historic boats. So yeah. Your grandmother's dining chair, probably not. Um, remembering, so this year for 2021, we will have $10 million spread across the state. That's not much. So I need you all to help me lobby for more money. Um, it's, it's plenty of money. It's a good, it's a good stash of, of money to put toward restoration, but these grants are competitive. We will get three times as many asks as we can fund. Um, so there has to be a good reason why we would fund a movable thing. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Dorothy, for that question. Does anybody have a question that they want to, oh, okay, great, okay, another one. <laughs> I keep worrying we're gonna run out of questions that they, they keep popping up here. So Kristen says, um, is this grant program an annual funding opportunity pending budgetary appropriations? Yes, and we have moved to, that was the big shift in 2014 that we had been on bond issues, which came out every three or four years, sometimes two, sometimes five. And it was very it's very hard for the trust to plan in advance because we weren't quite sure when the next bond issue would be. By moving to the corporate business tax, we have an annual appropriation subject to how much money is in the corporate business tax. Um, so we are living off of last year's funds, so we're probably okay. Next year might be a little pinchy because that's when the full effect of COVID and business constriction will become apparent. Um, but it is at this point an annual thing. The appropriation is, is made in January and we are looking forward to that 
getting getting better. Thank you. Great. Um, a question I'd missed earlier. Thank you uh, for bringing that up. Dennis um, says interpretive signage was mentioned. Would grants be available for plaques or other designations for National Historic Register, New Jersey Historic Register designated or eligible properties if they are privately owned? Possibly, and that's that comes out of our license plate fund, hence my advertisement to everybody get a license plate. <laughs> it sends us a little bit of money. Um, particularly innovative ways of signage or recognition um, Again, because it's a very limited fund, we're trying to look for um, new Trump. ideas rather than bronze plaques, lovely as they are, they've been around for a hundred years. Um, so we've just funded some interesting wayfinding systems and marking systems for historic sites that include both public and private property in a, in a trail sense. Um, you know, going going along a path or something, you could mark places. So, put your thinking cap on. What could what could be innovative? What could you set set to um, inspire other people to follow? And we might consider funding that probably through the license plate funding program, which is a maximum of five thousand dollar grants. And that is um, you can find out about that a little bit more on the on the website. Mm -hmm. Uh, Marge Sullivan writes, is this year primarily grants for capital and preservation versus National Register nominations and plans? It's, we, ha we, have, we have resisted giving quotas for any of those three categories, the planning, the capital grants, or the multi-phase thing. Um, it is all the same pot, and we will see how the applications come in. Um, so we don't, it used to be when we had the bond issues and we had money in a different way, we would say one year was for planning and one year was for capital because it helped the trust control their money over several year period. Now it's annual. We say what, what's needed is what's needed. So all the grant categories are open. Um, we encourage applications for what you need in this coming year. Grants are open for two years. Um, so your ability to, and you can of course return, hopefully after you've successfully completed one. Um, it's helpful to, to have lots of your plans in place because the one thing the trust doesn't really like is you get a grant and you can't get it together to actually execute it in the two years. Um, that's, that's hard because now we've given you money that perhaps somebody else could have. So all I would say is make sure you've got whatever it is, a national register nomination or a big plan or a multi-phase, a phase of a multi-phase product, um, be ready to execute it. Okay. Great. Um, that's, that's an important question. And, and Carrie again also says all grant levels are open this year. And I'm going to drop in the chat and, um, where you can see all those different grant levels on the historic trust website. Um, it seems to not be linking for some reason. So, but, um, all right. Dorothy asks, who does the archeology span at the various sites that the trust funds? Who does it? Mm-hmm. Hey, what, what cons is there a consulting database or um, anything like that that people can access? No, because we can't advertise any particular person or firm. There are archaeology firms in New Jersey. Um, I think if you talk to a staff member about what, what kind of archaeology you're looking at, if it's for Native American or early American or late 19th century and if it's water archaeology underwater archaeology or land archaeology I think there are people who who have specialties in each thing so that would be to me a question a specific question for someone at the trust if you're going down that road mm -hmm. and Samuel mentioned uh there's a resource the New Jersey Association of Archaeology and Archaeologists that you could go Thank to you. um right. And I just mentioned as well, Preservation New Jersey has a, a building industry network on our website 
that I believe we have a couple archaeologists as members of. So, so there's right. some places to go look. Yep. Right. But it's a good question. It's not everybody knows has one on speed dial. So, right. Good right. question. Great. Thank you. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions before I kind of go into our closing slides? Any, anything? Any la any last thoughts? Okay. So let me share my screen. Okay. Let's see here. All right. So, um, well, first of all, before we move on, just I want to say thank you again to Janet and for Mark um, for coordinating. This was very informative um, and, I, and we had a lot of good questions and great attendance. So I know other people got some value here. And, and hopefully again, if you're very interested, um, you know, and you can go tomorrow and, and have even more in-depth conversations um, with the New Jersey Historic Trust uh, staff members, which will be uh, a nice way to follow up on this kind of introduction to the trust programs that were offered today. Uh, hopefully you can join us. Our next event, uh, it's a, it'll be a little different uh, format, but it'll be a conversation with uh, Tim Sullivan, who's the CEO of New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Uh, we'll be discussing the recently passed uh, Historic Properties Reinvestment Act and what that means. It's still very early stages um, for, that legis uh, for that act, but we wanted to bring Tim in early uh, for our Preservation New Jersey community and uh, members to understand what their thought process is behind the act, uh, what they know so far, and, and start to understand how our historic members can be using it. Um, if you're not a member of New Preservation New Jersey, please do join. Um, we have business memberships, organization memberships, uh, individual level memberships. We do a lot of educational programming like this. Our 10 most endangered announcement is coming up in May with um, some exciting educational programming um, and field trips to follow to 10 most sites. We're really trying to kind of make a big splash this year, uh, even bigger than usual with that list and the resources that come with being listed or being a past list uh, member. So hopefully you can stay tuned there. And, uh, and just connect with us. So uh, hopefully you have, you know, you have our, our, we have a new phone number I wanted to highlight. That's our new phone, Dale, who's on the call and I will pick up there. Follow us on social media, go to our website. This is recorded um, and all of our sessions are recorded and I put it in the chat box where to go find those under events on our website. 